Hi, we're Shannon and Jerry Arner. And our dog, Betty White. Your hosts of the Arner Adventures podcast. Could we have named it something more creative? Probably. But it's the name of our blog. It's our last name. We're on an adventure. Yada, yada, yada. After running our own business, working 24-7. And don't forget a mental breakdown in between. We made a lifestyle change and decided to make the most out of life. We sold our house, most of our belongings, downsized, and moved to the coast. We live life minimally, but fully. We live each day as an adventure. This show will help you learn how to live life more fully, with more intention, by experiencing more, and with less stuff. We'll talk about our own experiences, interview others who have much to share by creating a spark in our lives. Some days we'll share real life ongoings of what we're going through and others will talk about our favorite flavor of waffle. Come join our adventure. It's It's the the Arner Adventures Adventures Podcast. Podcast. Hello everyone, I'm Shannon. And I'm Jerry. And our sweet bundle of joy, Betty White, is here. And we are back with episode 11 of the Arner Adventures podcast. And today is March 1st, Mardi Gras. Right? Yeah, that S is silent, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Like Illinois and Des Moines. Uh... Yes, it's Fat Tuesday, and we're going to be digging into our king cake tonight, some pancakes. Really do it up in the Arner household for Mardi Gras. We have a fun, easy king cake recipe that we will link in the show notes if you are interested. Yeah, today is my mom's birthday, too. Happy birthday, Mom. Happy birthday, Bev. Speaking of my mom, in today's episode, it's a guest episode, Sparking Our Lives, To say that this guest is a spark in our lives is an understatement. And you know what? Listen, you guys know me. And if you've been listening to the podcast since the beginning, you already know that I'm a fangirl. I am full throttle fan or not. I am all or nothing if I'm about something. Okay. Today's guest. Well, listen, you know what? Before we get into the guest, let's go ahead and get into our review of the week. (laughs) Let's do that first. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, let's do that. This comes from Harley Rudy. This is a wonderful podcast to listen to with such valuable content, informative, easy to listen to, enjoy the spark in our lives guests and a new perspective on life. Thank you so much, Harley. We love reading reviews. We love, of course, five-star reviews, but we love reading that you all love the the guest interviews. We think that that is amazing. Yeah. And if you'd like to be our review of the week and get a chance to receive a gift from Sugar Wish, please take a moment and give us a five-star review or rating. We have an easy link for you all to follow. It's lovethepodcast.com slash Arner Adventures. We will also link it to you in the show notes. It really helps us so much to support us in that way. It really does. And it helps us to create more content. It inspires us emotionally, spiritually, and just we're so appreciative. Well, let's go ahead and get to our guest today. Fun fact little behind the scenes information here. When we have these interviews virtually, we we do them on a, a virtual platform so that we get to sort of, you know, meet them. We get to see them. Of course, it's all audio. Actually, we are working on the audio quality. We're, we're improving that. So that is going to get better. But this guest who, you know, if you see the title of the podcast, you already know it's Scout Sobel. And my mom and I are big fangirls of this guest. Scout is such an inspiration to us. We get into the whole story at the beginning of the podcast, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you that when my mom found out that Scout had agreed to the podcast, which again, we've said before, we're always shocked when people say yes to being a guest on the podcast. But when Scout said yes, my mom, you know, was just as teary and as excited as I was. And so we had my mom on the beginning of the interview to say hello to Scout. And so my mom was able to say hello to her at the beginning and and sort of meet her virtually. And it was just this, you know, five minute fangirl moment with all of us and Jerry. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, Jerry, of course, hears all the Scout isms all the time. So Jerry knows Scout as well as we do because he hears about her all the time. So anyway, it was just this wonderful, you know, I'd say hour with Scout. It was just life-changing and wonderful. And so 
anyway, I guess we'll just go ahead and get into the episode because I'm just, I keep talking about it and we should just get into it, right? Yes, we should. Let's, let's, let's proceed. You guys, I am going to try so hard not to fangirl. I mean, I don't even know if I'm going to try. She has been such an inspiration from an entrepreneurial standpoint but also from a mental health stance, a true spark in my life. And I know Jerry's life because it resonates over to him when what we call scout isms are posted all over my workspace on the fridge, but we'll go ahead and get into the intro. Our guest today is Scout Sobel. Scout Sobel is the founder of Scout's Agency, co-host of the popular OK Sis podcast, host of the Emotional Entrepreneur podcast and the best-selling author of The Emotional Entrepreneur. She's a trailblazer in the media industry for utilizing podcasts as a powerful form of PR. After starting OK Sis, which focuses on female guests, Scout fell in love with spreading women's stories and identified the rising popularity and influence of podcasting. She started Scout's Agency with an emphasis in podcast PR for women entrepreneurs, podcasters, and brands. In two and a half years, Scout's Agency has become the leading agency for getting women as guests on podcasts. Scout has also lived with bipolar disorder for the last 15 years. She was once unable to function in society, but after finding entrepreneurship and taking radical responsibility over her emotions, she is now able to live a life of purpose. Her debut book, The Emotional Entrepreneur, which I know you all have seen all over my Instagram story, provides the mindset and emotional tools she learned from managing her mental illness that have helped her succeed in business. The Emotional Entrepreneur hit number 11 on Amazon for Women in Business and the top 100 charts for entrepreneurship and is a staple in my life and I carry it with me everywhere. It's my Bible. You guys, we have her on the podcast today, Scout Sobel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. This is making my day, my week, my month, just hearing how my book has transformed, impacted, and inspired you guys is a true, true honor. I, we were talking before the podcast that my mom, of course, carries it with her everywhere. It's bookmarked and has all kinds of markings in it and I read it, of course, I turned her on to it. She retired and then started her own business and she has her own mental health journey. And so it it resonates with both of us, but she and I have these conversations all the time. And then of course, Jerry knows so much about the book from both of us. (laughs) So we absolutely love it. And I was, of course, in your masterclass in December when we were knee deep in launching this podcast. And That was when, of course, so encouraging in the podcast world of us starting this podcast. So not only have you been encouraging in, you know, the emotional entrepreneurial standpoint, but then in podcasting as well. So you just are, you just have a finger on so many points of our life and you don't even know about it. Oh, I know. It's the crazy part of the new age of what we do, what we, how we do what we do. When you're a content creator and you put out podcast episodes or you're an author, you create one piece and then countless people can either benefit from it or are impacted by it. And it's so hard for the source to understand that impact. One, because they don't see it. Um, and two, just because with the internet, the vast possibilities of people hearing you is totally mind blowing. So, so you, you actually just moved into a new house and a new office, right? Yeah. Probably been a lot. (laughs) Yeah. None of those were planned. Like, you know, I, I obviously was manifesting a house for a long time, but I wasn't really sure if it was going to happen in I thought it was going to happen like late 2022, the office, very similar. I started looking for places and I just kind of allowed the flow to happen. I don't think if I had planned it properly, I would have moved into an office a month before, you know, putting in an offer on a home and closing. But I find that I rapid cycle through growth and expansion moments in my life. And I always get to that point where I get overwhelmed and I wonder why I do this to myself. And then I have to remind myself of who I am and why I do what I do and how that kind of overwhelming point does flow through and it leaves and you're left with the fulfillment. So I trust all of my decisions. I trust all of my desires, but sometimes 
I ask God why I have to do all of them at the same time. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Sometimes it's not on your time. Yeah. yeah. The, the people who do follow us on Instagram know that I got your book. I was introduced to you when I was listening to Her Life by Design, Christina Galbato's podcast, mm. and immediately got your book because I was so intrigued by the title alone. Our mailman knows I can't stand mail, but I, I that day I was so excited it was coming. And I went immediately on our Instagram stories and was just shining it all over the place. And I was so excited. I hadn't even read the book yet, but I was so excited. Then I inhaled it and it was in the summer. So I just remember like going to the beach and constantly rereading it and rereading it and all the lessons. One of the things that I completely love about you, of course, is your podcast. Then I started listening to the podcast, but I guess the question I have is that you're so seasoned in the podcast world and you speak so openly about your journey. What made you decide to drop all that knowledge into a book? So my first dream that I can remember having when I was really young was to be an author. So I used to write, you know, picture chapter books in elementary school. And the minute I learned how to read and write, that's all I wanted to do. I would lock myself in my room as a young kid. I didn't want to really be social. I tried to not go to school and camp as much as I could. And I preferred to be alone in my room reading and writing. And I kept a a diary, a journal. I've kept one journal every single year since I was 13 years old, Black Moleskin Journal. And so writing actually was my first true love. I went to college for it, albeit I dropped out, but I was always studying either writing, whether it was creative nonfiction, journalism, creative writing, poetry, or studying English literature. So writing was really my first love. I think it's the thing that I'm, it's probably my biggest uh, strength as far as a tool and a skill. And so that's always been in the back of my mind to become an author. I kind of went through different avenues of expression, such as I started a magazine, which is, you know, in the public mm -hmm. space, and I would write the articles for that. Um, but when I took journalism classes, my favorite thing to do was to write profiles. And so when I started a podcast, I realized that I was profiling just audibly and not writing it down. So there's always been a part of me that's always been interested in either the spoken word or the written word. And so podcasting in my career just came first. Writing a book is the only thing I've ever wanted to do that I didn't jump into without thinking, because I think that when you write a book, one, you need to have a certain amount of lived experience to come to a point where you have a thesis and you have an idea behind it. So I was waiting for the right time. And this presented itself to me end of 2020. And it felt, I remember when I came up with the, the name of the book and it just felt in my bones like something bigger than a book. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I came to the decision to write a book. It's been in me since I was very, very young. It's actually my first my first dream and goal. That's interesting. You relate to that a lot too because of your journaling. Dear you story. Yeah, I like to journal too. Yeah. I I can't say I'm as consistent as you sound as you are, but uh, it's a hard thing to be consistent with. From I get from reading people talking about journaling, but I do get on good rolls with it. I but you're pretty consistent, right? Oh yeah, I journal first thing in the morning, uh -huh. and I think it helps with anxiety because I think those who are either prone to anxiety or mental illness, mental health issues, that thing that you do, the, the first thing you do when you wake up is you try to grasp and make sense of what your day is and who you are and what your dreams yeah. are, et cetera. And yeah. so I literally wake up, go upstairs, grab my coffee, sit down and I journal. And that's how I wake up. That's how I literally, my subconscious and my conscious thinking mind comes online. So I journal about one to two pages in the morning and then I meditate because I find it's very difficult to meditate in the morning if I haven't moved energy. I think those who are more anxiety prone need to move energy first thing. So I get it all out. There's no prompt. It's subconscious. Sometimes I'm writing, I'm tired, I'm tired. I Or other times I planned my whole six-month marketing plan for my book. I didn't plan on doing that, but that's what came out that morning. So ah. I think it to be the most useful first thing in the morning, which I know is a practice from uh, the book, The Artist's Way, which I have not read. But that's how I find myself to, one, 
get in the groove of journaling and to get the most benefits out of journaling as if it's first thing in the morning. I can see that. That's probably worked for me better, but I've always tended to just do it on weekends and I should start tomorrow. I start weekdays. <laughs> One of the things that also I love about you is that, you know, you've mentioned in the book and on your podcast is of course, not allowing your mental illness to be a wall, but allow it to help you flourish. And I know you said this in a podcast. I don't remember if it was yours or you were on someone else's. Someone was saying to you that they were recently diagnosed with bipolar and they were pretty bummed about it. And you said to them, oh, you're one of the lucky ones. Oh. And I thought it was, first of all, so amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder at what point or do you recall at what point did you, do you remember, did it sort of switch that you were able to see mental illness being a light and something that was flourishing? You know, it, that idea started solidifying when I started my business because I was able to recognize that so many of my peers were unable to move past certain parts in their business because of their emotional state. They weren't used to dealing with uncertainty or anxiety, um, risk-taking, et cetera. And so my mental illness, when I was going through the thick of it, really forced me to get out of the societal framework of you graduate, you go to college, you get a job, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was breaking down everything in my life. My life was breaking down so that it could be rebuilt. And in that, I learned a lot of emotional lessons. And so when I saw, you know, and I should say, when I started Scott's Agency, I was shocked at how hard it was emotionally. I really was shocked. I was like, whoa, I deal with bipolar. And I'm pretty surprised that dealing with clients and the financial risk, et cetera, is this emotionally tolling. But I saw myself being able to persevere because I had the mental health training from managing my bipolar disorder. And I saw so mm -hmm. many women not being able to even get into the game, not because they didn't have the resources or the college education or the finances or the tools or the connections. They couldn't get into it because of their emotions. They couldn't get past imposter syndrome. They couldn't get past fighting for their lives. And so that's when it started resonating with me that my emotions were going to make me strong in business. Um, but actually, I, I really haven't thought of it this. I, I've never really kind of pinpointed it. So thank you for asking. Um, when the pandemic hit, everyone was freaking out. And I was like, oh, no, I I'm fucking good. I'm ready. I've been training for this moment my entire life. Uncertainty, anxiety, et cetera, bring it on. And so I actually, in that week, looked to myself and said, this is the moment that you step up as a leader and you help those who have not been dealing with emotional turmoil in different ways. Because in this moment, I feel like I'm ready and I'm prepared. And Glennon Doyle said the same thing. Her, yeah. her wife was like, why are you so calm? And she's like, because finally the entire world is feeling the same thing I've been feeling my whole life, except I have a couple years on them. Yeah. So I feel a little stronger in this moment. So I think it was starting my business and then the pandemic, the way I was able to get through the oh. pandemic, it was, I was like, oh, whoa, my, my bipolar has prepared me for some pretty, pretty big things. That's interesting because I was telling you how I was, I was gearing up for all of this anxiety and I felt like I actually got healthier during the pandemic. I felt like I was in a better place during it. So that's interesting that you said that because that makes me realize that maybe that was my situation too. Mental wellness is something we talk a lot about here on Arner Ventures, which is great. It should be part of the daily conversation. Mental wellness is important. We wanted to share a resource that we love, have used, and refer to others. It's a game changer in helping you find a therapist to match your specific needs. Full transparency, I remember being at one of my lowest points a few years ago, desperate for help needing a therapist who had a specific skill set. I'd been calling around, Googling, trying to make a connection with someone who could help me. No one understood the level of grief I was experiencing. And when I finally called my local crisis and assessment center, thinking they could help me, I couldn't get help there either. Here's the thing. 
Finding a therapist should not be this difficult. We have found a wonderful resource that takes all of the difficulty away from matching you with a therapist to fit your specific needs and preferences. It's Mental Health Match. Mental Health Match literally takes the stress out of finding a therapist by answering just a few questions. It's free to use, takes minutes, and is the easiest way to find a therapist. You can choose therapy approaches, topics to tackle, skills you want to learn, and if there are traits about a therapist that are important to you, you can choose those too. If price is a concern, you can choose insurance, no insurance. You can search that route as well. You can also find therapy options for in-person or virtual. Once you have your therapist matches, you can choose whether or not you want to share your information or contact them on your own. Like I said, I've used this. We've shared this with friends and family who have used this option. It's such an easy process. We encourage you to give it a try. Finding someone to talk to is so important in maintaining mental wellness. Visit mentalhealthmatch.com to find a therapist that is the best match for you. It's the easiest way to find a therapist. I talk about, and I actually put it on my story because I was trying to think of how you said it. And then I found it on your Instagram and I'm just going to repeat the quote so I can make my point and then ask the question. You said, I used to make my hunger wrong. My primal need to create, expand and grow. I used to label this deep energy, which awakens me at night with new ideas as too much. I have come to understand that out in our too muchness lies our strong uniqueness. And so today I proudly am too much. So, and I think you talked about this in your book where you could wake up at night and have these sort of racing thoughts in your mind and you're, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stifle it. I'm going to, you know, shut it down. You actually use it and then say, okay, I'm going to get up or I'm going to, you know, go ahead and do some work. And when I read that, I said, you know what? You're right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just feel like there's something wrong or, or whatever. And, you know, Growing up, I had all these OCD tendencies that, and to be really um, overly neat. And I was always ridiculed about it, about having things in a certain order. And now it, I actually use it to my advantage in business and, and things. And so I guess my question to you is, how do you know or how are you able to set boundaries for when that might get to... Too much, much, too much. <laughs> able to recognize, you know, because I was thinking about it once when I had a period of, oh, I don't think I've been sleeping for a few nights or, you know, mm -hmm. are you able to recognize it yourself or, or, or do you have boundaries on that? Yeah. You know, the subtleties of when things are useful and when we need to move on and not hold on to them anymore is such, such a difficult place to find yourself in. It takes so much emotional work and awareness within your body to know if something that is quote unquote too much is serving you or it's not serving you any longer. And so yeah. I think for me, reminding myself that I am in control is really important. So there are times when I can't turn it off, right? And when I can't turn it off, that's when I know that I've exited past a healthy, energetic experience. I feel as if I was making, I'll go back. I was making myself wrong because I thought that if I create too much, I'll be seen as too much. Or why can't I just relax and be okay with a relaxing day? Am I a workaholic? Um, is this healthy, et cetera? And so I was asking myself all these questions and I've come to the conclusion that it, it is healthy because it's me. It's how I am. It's not I don't work and create because I feel as if I'm unworthy if I don't do it. I work and create because I'm biologically wired that way. I work and create like other people breathe. And so once I had to accept that that was me, that I didn't have to prove to the world that I had a nice work-life balance and I didn't have to prove to the world that I wasn't working on weekends. Um, once I just proudly exclaimed almost, 
almost kind of like when you realize you love money, you know, like yeah. I say it out loud, I'm like, no, I love money. And I'll say it out loud <laughs> in public places. I think I had to get to that point where I was like, no, I love being in a creative flow. That's what lights me up. That's what makes me unique. That's what allows me to create what I create. And I think we've been taught that like the tortured artist, right? If you have certain gifts and certain unique abilities, or you're born with something that you are enslaved to them and you have to be a martyr in order for them to come forward. That's also incorrect. So it's about finding that balance of saying, wow, I'm really creative. I'll I'll use my poetry, for example. I stopped writing poetry because it was so dark that it, it, it put me back into my depression. But I thought to myself, I'm given this poetic message for a reason. I have to move through it. I have to get it out. In the sake of art, it'll be okay when I was killing myself internally. And so I now have parameters around that. You know, I can tell when I'm going a little bit too deep, I am removing myself from reality a little bit too much. And I get to uh, alter and kind of like pivot the experience, the emotion in the moment by doing something completely different to get me out of that. So, okay. For me, I recognize when it's coming, when it's becoming a problem, when I don't feel aligned, like this doesn't feel good to me anymore. Yeah, It gets to feel good. And if it doesn't feel good, you stop what you're doing. You put your phone away. You go for a walk. You get a cup of tea. You do a meditation. You take a workout class. You remove yourself from the situation and do something completely different to interrupt the pattern. Yeah. I always say, if this is confusing to you, you can't understand if you're feeling excitement or anxiety or, you know, um, Shaman Durek has this great exercise. He writes about it in his book where you, you pick something that's a hell yes. And you pick something that's a hell no. And imagine the hell yes and feel what it feels like. Close your eyes and feel what it feels like in your body. And then imagine the hell no, feel what that feels like. And it's a different response that you're going to have. And if you can train yourself over and over again to oh. understand the difference in your body between a hell yes and a hell no, then you can start making decisions based off the way you feel. Uh-huh. I, like I do too. I, like yeah. I get that book right after this. Yeah, yeah it's, a very, it's a very, uh, very out there woo-woo book, just letting you know. We love that shit. Though. Okay. I have to journal in the morning. <laughs> we love that shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Before I forget, because I had this train of thought, um, catching up here, Shannon really, really knows your work, and I find this really interesting. But I know she has told me that you just you found ways to focus your energy a little different than what is considered uh, the standard, you know. And and if you if you wake up at night, why just sit there and let your mind run? put it into a little work or whatever. And I have read that like pre-modern times, it wasn't that uncommon for people to, to write or to go out for walks in the middle of the night and they can sleep. Cause you know, that by seven o'clock it was dark and they used to go to sleep then. So you had a long, a longer dark period mm-hmm. and it wasn't so uncommon to split up your night of sleep and do things mm-hmm. in the middle of the night. But of course in modern society, that's sort of everything's crunched because you're up later at 10 PM, 11 and, it's all crunched into an eight hour sleep period. And that does not benefit the hmm. probably the creative mind. It, it huh. needs so much. And I, I think, think it's neat that, that yeah. you, you do, uh, you utilize that, that's kind of style. I think it's yeah, really good. Even during the day, you know, like for example, I, at my agency, the, the women who work for me, you know, why, well, I don't want you to, I don't want them to sit at their computer at one o'clock when they have brain fog one day and they're tired and they're just yeah. going to keep sitting here because they're on the clock. Go take a nap. Yeah. Go for a walk. Watch yeah. a TV show in the middle of the day. Like <laughs> yeah. we have to start working with our body's energies because when we do, we then feel like when we're on, we're on. And when we're off, we're off. And we're not like fighting against trying to make something happen that's not naturally happening. I mean, obviously, we live in a time where you have to show up for things, of course. But if you have a couple hours in your afternoon without calls, I tell them, and you are just, you're, it's not working. The brain's not functioning. Close your laptop and watch a TV show or take a nap. You know, that's going to benefit all of us and you in the long run so much more than just forcing yourself through something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big, big nap fan. Yeah. He is. <laughs> yes. You too. 
kind of get down, but I, I have, I want to bring something up and then I know you're going to have something really inspiring to say, but I'm bring up something that um, it sounds like you have a, a really great support system with your family, your sister Maddie, of course, and your husband at the time when this happened was your boyfriend and it was in the book and things were not going so well for you. And he had said to you, I don't care if you're depressed, if you are depressed and hopeful, I can be in this relationship. If you're depressed and hopeless, I can't do this with you. And first of all, I thought that was so impactful to hear that because I think the people in our lives who are our loved ones, I don't think we think about how hard it is on them to be in our lives. And and it's so hard on them to to hear that. It, it, It was just, it was so impactful. And so I was thinking women, especially who might not have support systems around them and might not have anyone around them to maybe say those things to them. And I'm just wondering if there are women who may be suffering and recognize that they're suffering and maybe, you know, are in that, I got to keep hustling. I got to fake it till I make it and keep going. Do you have any words for them? Do you have anything to say to them other than of course, read your book, because I think there's so many great nuggets in this that that would help. And I wish I, the only down about this book is that it wasn't around like five years ago (laughs) because I think it could have been so beneficial to me, but more than it is now. But other than read your book, of course, do you have anything that you could say to someone who might not have a good, a good support system? Yes. So I am very blessed that I had someone who was the catalyst for me in that moment. But before him, I had an amazing support support system and I wasn't getting better. Support systems are so important for us to not feel alone. They are. And I want to reflect that I got better when I decided I wanted to get better. The only person that saved me was myself. So if you don't have someone who can look you in the eye like my husband did, allow me to be that catalyst. You think you need one, but you don't. You need to internally decide that the cards that you have been dealt, that the emotions that you are feeling, that the circumstances that you are living in can be changed by you. I think for many years, I outsourced my emotions. I would text my dad, I can't do it anymore, come over, make me dinner, I need a psychiatrist note to get me out of work, I need you know, I need you to drive me to the hospital, can I spend the night? I had my best friend remove every sharp object in my house one time. That really wasn't supportive. I think that sometimes in the mental illness world and I like to be careful with my, with what I say here, but in the addiction world, there's a little bit of an accountability for your healing. There's a lot of accountability for your healing, right? Right. There's a very big difference between bipolar and addiction and alcoholism. Don't get me wrong. But what I wish someone would have told me was that I wasn't a clinical, I I wasn't a patient. I wasn't a clinical experiment. I wasn't something that needed to be medicated and monitored and things like severe were passed around, et cetera. All of those things are so disempowering to our human human experience. I wish someone told me that I had way more in my control than I thought I did. Mm. The narrative that I had a chemical imbalance, which is true, and that's why I was feeling this way, didn't actually put me into an active role around my healing. Right. So for anyone listening who thinks that it's the support system they need, it's a similar train of thought of, well, it's the money I need. It's the car I need. It's the house I need. It's the job I need. The person that will save you is you. My husband was the catalyst, but I am responsible for my own happiness and healing every single day. And if I don't show up in that pursuit, he has every right to call me out and say, hey, you're not, you're not, you know, doing your end of the bargain here. Mm -hmm. So once we can take radical responsibility over our emotions and our healing and know that when we look around, what we see is in many ways created by the limitations we have put on ourselves. You can free up yourself to know that it's not external, but that you have the power. So if there's someone in your life, that's not the catalyst, I will be it. Follow me on Instagram for free. Listen to my podcast for free. 
if you want to buy the book, buy the book. But I am here as I put a lot of stuff out there to help that moment, to help you feel less alone in that. And, and we all need support systems. So there are many free support groups out there. Support groups changed my life. NAMI is an incredible resource. They have free support groups multiple times a week, virtually or in person. And so getting into something like that, getting into rooms of people who are similar to you, getting into digital communities, um, like-minded people, Facebook groups, Geneva groups, et cetera. There's so many people out there that can serve as that support system because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say that that's not important because it a hundred percent is you don't have to do this alone by any means, but I do want to open you up to the possibility that maybe the person that's going to save you and heal you is you and only you. I love that. I do too. I think that's so valuable because the more you seek uh, support system, which look, and I agree with you, it is good. The more you can get become almost like a little addiction of its own. Like I need more therapy or I need more of this. And it, it's and driving you away thing. from what you really need to do inside. Yeah. 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 And if you're on a healing journey and you're actively fighting for your life, you will meet people along that journey that will align with the type of support that you need in those given moments. We have audience questions. First one is, I quit my job, started my own business, but it's been difficult. I keep rereading the lessons in your book, but fear keeps holding me back. Should I put a timeline on when I should give up or move on? Well, I think you have to ask yourself, do you want to quit because of fear or do you want something to not work because of something external? So, Mm -hmm. you know, my sister was having a problem with this similar. And I said, well, do you want your business to quote unquote fail, which I don't believe in failures. Do you want your business to quote unquote, whatever, not work, not be in existence because the market wasn't there or the investor didn't fall fall through, or you had a bad deal happen and it set you back. Or do you want to be the one that's the reason why you're not successful? So I think you have to ask yourself that. And if you want to be the reason you're not successful, then you will continue to follow fear. And also, you know, it's okay that you're afraid. Fear is allowed to be here. In fact, it, it doesn't go away. I'm afraid right now. I'm about to put down this investment. I'm scared shitless. Fear is not something that we need to like get rid of. It's actually a beautiful sign that you're expanding and growing into something bigger than what you were in yesterday, a second ago, a few hours ago. So fear is not the enemy. Fear is a beautiful visitor that says, hey, you're doing something bigger than you were doing yesterday. You sure you want to go in there? And so when it comes, thank it for its arrival. I was going to say, a scout is a myth. Oh, hi, Fear. Hi, Fear. (laughs) I'm on to big shit today. Thank you for being here. Yeah, exactly. So you are on the right path. You just have to know that fear is not trying to tear you down. It's telling you to keep going. Okay. I love that. Okay. Do you have any advice or can you talk about the contentious breakup of business partners? Oh my God. Fuck. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I won't go into business with anybody. I am, I actively say very loudly, you know, my sister is really the only person I'll do it because okay says is not um, we're not dependent on our livelihood on OK says. So right. it, it's different. Um, I will not have a co-founder. I will not ever go into a business venture where it is 50, 50 percent equity split ever. I've done it multiple times and business breakups are incredibly difficult to move through. Um, they are emotional. They are confusing. It, business personal gets mixed up. It's it's a fucking nightmare. Uh-huh. That being said, some people really like partnerships and have really, really great experiences with them. I think they do say, though, that um, more partnerships fail than marriages. But uh-huh. <laughs> um, for me personally, knowing myself how I work, I think I'm a really nice person. And I think I'm a, a total asshole sometimes in business. And so I need to be the 100% owner for 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 me to feel aligned and good within my work. Other people, if you want to take a partner, take a partner. But for me, it, it's a hard no. Okay. When you started Scouts Agency, how mm-hmm. many people were you pitching a day and how did you manage it? For prospective clients, I emailed a thousand women within the first 24 hours of starting 
Gmail blocked my email and I, oh, yeah, it was I did spam and so I had to open another yeah. one. Yeah. So I am known for over pitching versus under pitching. And I think that that's really where, why I'm, why I'm here today, but in a podcast tour on average, every single week we pitch anywhere from 20 to 50 podcasts, depending on the client and their goals. Um, and we work with them for four months. So I don't know how to do that quick math, but yeah. Um, how did I manage that myself? Uh, I sat at a computer. I just went. And you just pitched. I just went. I got a coffee. I tunnel visioned in. And I just yeah. went. I got kind of addicted to it. I was like, yeah. this is fun. You know, you get in like a an automatic yeah. vibe zone. So, yeah. Yeah. You started your business and it's your only job. Hustling but struggling financially. Do you think that you should get a part-time job or push harder until things start clicking? Wow, such a good question. Um, you know, ooh, it, it's, a, it's a little difficult for me to give a blanket answer on this without knowing your exact financials. Like, have you pulled back from spending in other areas or mm -hmm. have you, you know, gone to everything first? I would do everything first before getting a, another job, in my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. if you're in this position, I would really invite you to work on your money mindset. Yeah. There's, there's some scarcity stuff going on there. Um, so I don't have a specific resource off the top of my head, but, oh, I have an abundance versus scarcity episode on the Emotional Entrepreneur podcast. That's good. Yeah. Yep. I think this is probably an opportunity for your emotional stuff to, to move through scarcity to get to abundance. The money is there. The money is yeah. there. There is no shortage of money. You are capable of making money. So getting that part-time job, I respect people who do that, who get to that point where they're like, listen, in order for me to make this work, I will work this part-time job. And if you're going to, make sure it's something that's more mindless um, mm. in the sense of you don't want it taking up all of your time. So I always say if Scott's agency left tomorrow, I would drive Postmates and just put on podcasts that were in the industry of the next business I wanted to start. So I'm learning while I'm making money or being like a barista at a low key coffee shop. You don't want to get into a part-time yeah. job that consumes you in your career because uh -huh. you want to make sure that your priority is on your business. Okay. Last one of those is how do you keep your spirit up as an entrepreneur when it seems like there are so many obstacles? I say you listen to your podcast, but you tell me. <laughs> um, I, I think it's why do you expect that life will have no obstacles? Yeah. That's life. You have to yeah. accept whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a mother or you're a wife or you're a W-2 employee. Obstacles follow you no matter what path you go down. So you have to decide which obstacle and which path do you want to go down being an entrepreneurship feels like there's more obstacles because it is the most biggest expansive personal development game in the world. But I think the question is, or reframing your belief to just totally accepting obstacles, discomfort as a complete normal part of the human experience. And once you just accept that shitty times come, that things don't go your way, that there are moments where you're going to be frustrated and disconnected and tired and stressed and depressed and anxious, you can make decisions that are based on the final end result because you're okay to walk through the challenges because you've already accepted that they're going to come. Yeah. You that just, that just sounds to me like advice that would come from somebody so much older. I, it's just incredible. That's what my mom says. Well, my, well, yeah, I figured she. My mom is way, always I mean, like, "How am I in my sixties?" And I take all this advice <laughs> from Scout. I mean, that's where the uh, the lucky thing comes in. I'm so yeah. lucky because bipolar has given me these insights and this this strength. I mean, literally, I wake up every day, guys, like in awe of life. I'm so grateful. I'm so oh, grateful. I'm so I love when you post and you'll say um, some, and I'm going to completely tear this up, but you'll just post sometimes and you'll say, how do I fucking love my life so much? <laughs> and in that oh. though, I say that and discomfort happens to me all the time. I get irritable and angry and pissed. Things don't go my way or I lose money or I can't pay myself. Like there's always things, even when I say that, that aren't quote unquote picture perfect. 
And yet I know those things are the ticket for me to feel fulfilled. There is not one moment of my life that I will go by and not be grateful despite not feeling great emotionally, if that makes sense. And yeah, no, I, I love it. That's cool. Yeah, it means you're alive. I, you're yeah. you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is Jerry's favorite part is the rapid fire. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I will try to be as rapid fiery as I can. Okay. This is where we ask surface level questions. Very surface level. Just to get a basic okay. general idea yep. of how you feel about surface level subjects. Um, <laughs> and this is where I get to feel like a late night talk show host. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess I'm doing Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, Scott, we're going to start number one New York or LA? L oh, fuck. I hate LA now. So, um, I, oh, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. To live LA, but maybe to visit New York. Yeah. But LA all the way. I'm a West Coast. I'm, you know, I'm a California person. So. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, coffee or wine? Coffee. Eat in or dine out? Eat in. Beige or green? And then I'll tell you why we asked this. Beige? Because Beige, the Be color beige. Oh, the beige. Color green. Beige. Okay. Beige. And the reason we ask that is I sort of like, when I think of you, I just sort of think of those colors. I don't know why. Maybe it's just like the aesthetic that you have sort of in like your Instagram or I don't know. But beige and green are two of my brand colors. So that makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, moving right along. Beaches or mountains? Beach. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. <laughs> Book or audio? Book. Oh. Ketchup or mustard? Mustard. Handwritten letter or email? Handwritten letter. Mm -hmm. The last one, work from home or work from the office? Both. <laughs> Depends on my mood. Direct, so. <laughs> yeah. the important question we think is what does a life well lived mean to you? I think it's, I always go back to obviously a life well lived, meaning I believe that I'm safe in my emotions and the things that I am doing and creating and that are within my life are exactly what I want, not based off of someone else's idea of what I should do or a societal expectation, being able to completely know that everything in my life is something that I purposefully and intentionally chose. Oh, that's a wonderful answer. That is a wonderful that. answer. Yeah. I love that too. And that could be, I, we, I could journal about that tomorrow morning and start <laughs> weekday journaling. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. It's going to be good. Oh, yeah, this has been so great. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Um, before we go, can you please tell our listeners where they can find you? Of course, we're going to link all this in the show notes. Yes, you can. The best place is Instagram um, at Scout Sobel. You have links to everything there, to all my podcasts, to my book, newsletter, etc. And starting in May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, we have a lot of uh, my next launch coming up, so you can stay tuned for that. Well, we will link all of that down in, in the show notes, and I am going to encourage everyone to please sign up for your newsletter that comes out on Sundays, because yes. that it is also very inspiring, and I always look forward to it. And I know my mom does, too. She loves oh it, too. Gosh. I love your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're a better salesperson than I am for my stuff. I, I don't even I think you were like, listen to the podcast, buy her book. I think I said it like maybe once. I love it. <laughs> it's so great. Well, thank you again so much for being here. We appreciate it. I'm an official fanboy. <laughs> oh, that makes me so happy. Thank you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I mean. If you guys, <laughs> if you guys aren't fans of her now, I, I just don't even know. I mean, everybody to just stop what they're doing and go to Instagram and follow Scout Sobel. And then I want you to go to the link in her bio and I want you to buy the emotional entrepreneur book, <laughs> especially if you have 
a side hustle or the, you know, the, the dream of, of having any kind of a, a business or anything really and truly do get emotional thinking about it. But the only downside to me about Scout and the book is that it, it was not around, you know, maybe five, five or so years ago, really for me. Yeah, I know you said, well, my first thought is if someone tells me their name is Scout Sobel, I go, how can you go wrong there? <laughs> Scout Sobel, that, that's got to be an interesting person. And she lives right up to her, to the name. That's, right. Uh, yeah. Right. She's a spark. Scout is a spark. You, that, that was kind of my take is I thought, wow, she's really interesting. And uh, as an avid journaler, struggles to continue um, or, or keep it, keep up his, uh, my, my journaling habits sometimes, or I have some disruptions there. I was encouraged to talk to her because she is somebody that, that journals uh, every day. And I liked some of the advice that she gave me. And I'm always looking for good advice on that. Anybody that I, I think I just connect with somebody that's uh, that's into that because I think, oh, there's that's somebody that thinks like me that finds a need to to write down their thoughts and whatnot. So that was uh, I took a lot of value in that. I think that, too, when she said anyone who experiences anxiety uh, would benefit from from journaling. And I'll just tell you, I think she has said it. You have told me, my mom has told me, oh, you should journal. And the way that my mind works is I'm always like, I don't have time for that. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. The same way I was about meditating. I don't have time for that. I just don't have time. I'm just always, I got to go, 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 go. I've got too much to do. I've got too much to do. And when she said, you know, you should, I get up first thing in the morning and before I do anything, I journal. And she said, sometimes it's, I journal, I'm tired, I'm tired or whatever. But then she said, sometimes she creates her entire six month marketing plan and she had no intention of doing that. And I don't know, I, I it did inspire me to think, okay, about the free writing. And we've talked about that with sort of, um, you know, how we talked about creating our word for the year and it was abundance. And I'll just tell you guys, we didn't even talk about this when we talked about our intention for the year episode. Some of you might think this is woo woo. And some of you might think I've talked about this with a few people in our live. This is the, the God's honest truth. We did, we walk through our intention for the year and we, you know, we create, you know, we walk through our, our goals came up with our word for the year and Jerry and I have a shared word, which is abundance. And we have it posted in our home and we have it, you know, posted in different places. Our word for the year is abundance. Once we had come up with our word and one day I was like, okay, I, I'm going to kind of, I have sort of a ritual and routine. I go through every single morning. One day I was getting ready to sort of go through my routine and I was like, oh, I need to catch up and, and go through, um, go and see what Scout's episode is that I need to listen to that day. And I pull up the episode that I need to listen to, and it was about abundance. And I completely got chills all over my body. I screenshot it. I sent it to Jerry, and I sent it to my mom, and I said, look at this. I I can't even believe that, number one, I mean, you know, of course, Scout, <laughs> no, I didn't even you know, I'd never spoken to Scout and, and she had no idea, but it's just interesting how things sort of align in your life. And I, that her podcast was released that day. We had created our word, I don't know, a week or two before that. It was just, I don't know. It was just the way that things sort of align in your life. And I love how she talks about manifesting things in your life and putting things out into the world and on really low days and things, days where I sort of have these sort of loops in my, in my head of where I, I'm worried things aren't going to work out. And I can really just find an episode of her podcast, or I can go back to her book and find lessons where something will inspire me. Oh yeah. I can, uh, I can totally agree with that. And, uh, and then, then on a, on a side note, if you're anything like me and well, and by the way, I don't really recommend that to anybody, <laughs> but if you are anything like me, you would just love the way she articulates words. Yeah. She has a, a way of articulating words that we both think are so cool. She's very well-spoken. She's very well-spoken. And that's just a little aside to all her other 
uh, of many attributes. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, I just wanted to point this out that, uh, my mom, she came down to stay, I don't know, a couple, few months ago. And, um, I had, I don't know, I just was kind of in a, uh, rut. I don't know. There was, you know, you, how you get and, and being an entrepreneur, you can kind of get in these little things. And I came to my desk the next day to work and she wrote this note that was above my desk. And it said, it was a quote from scout. And it says, I have a deep rooted belief that I will be okay, no matter the outcome. And that if that outcome is not favorable, I would dust myself off and emerge stronger. Oh my. Yeah. And that is scout. That is scout. Just respect her so much. And I just think that she's just so positive and to have been through so much. And I, I, I get chills when I think about how, um, positive she is, especially for someone to go to her and and be really bummed about, you know, their mental illness and say that, you know, I've just been diagnosed or whatever. And she says, you know, you're one of the lucky ones. I just think that is so amazing. And I really just wish that, um, I wish that she would have been in my life earlier, but you know what? Timing is everything. And, and she's in my life now. And you know what? I hope that there's someone out there that we have, uh, brought her to your life. And that's why we have this podcast is to, she's a spark in our lives. And now hopefully she's a spark in someone else's life. I got to say that I love that quote. That's the kind of quote I would like to have on a trucker hat as opposed to all the really <laughs> cheesy ones you typically see, but that would have to be a really big hat. So that's a whole nother, a whole nother issue there, but I will, I will save that quote. Uh, and thanks for uh, introducing that. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want a heads up on our guests prior to our recordings and you want to have audience questions like we had on Scout's episode that you want answered, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And that way you can uh, get a heads up and you can submit questions and you can find all about Scout and the Emotional Entrepreneur book, the podcast, Scout's agency, of course, in the show notes. You can always find us at arneradventures.com on Instagram at arneradventures, also linked in the show notes. So until next time, enjoy the journey that you're on. We're wishing you lots of adventures. Bye. Bye.